When you think of Terraria mods, the Calamity mod is a no-brainer. As one of the biggest and most widely supported mods out there, it is easy to see why it's considered number one by so many of the community. From its bosses, to the weapons, to the artwork, and even the new multiple biomes, it adds in a plethora of new content just waiting to be discovered. However, an aspect of the Calamity mod that is slightly overlooked is the mod's lore. From legendary heroes, Raylor and Status, to the jungle tyrant Yerim, the mod is chock full of rich and plentiful backstory. An aspect of the story that some may know but not have too much knowledge of is of course Draedon. There are multiple items in the game, from Draedon's Forge, to Draedon's Heart, to all the new items from Rust and Dust that contain his name or at least reference to it, and even the knowledge that, according to the devs, this next update will contain a boss called Draedon. But who really is this mysterious figure in Calamity's lore? According to some of the devs and the community, he is the cyborg smith slash right hand man to the jungle tyrant Yerim aided him in his conquest over all of Terraria, and even the constructor of some of the most powerful weapons in the mod, like the Muramaza and the Exoblade, and apparently he created the armor that the DOG wears while you fight it. According to some, he could possibly be an alien from a different planet if his logs are to be believed. Speaking of that, throughout the world you may come across several laboratories that belong to Draedon all containing notes or logs of Draedon's work. That is what I have for you today, a representation of what Draedon's files could be if voice acted and with a bit of added content to them, provided that I don't have too much support like money wise to like make a nice um, setup. Without further ado, let's get right into the files of the Cyborg Draedon. As I record this, it would not be a stretch to call the jungle the hub of this planet. All is centered around it, and none, no, not of it. It brings me no small amount of unease to see the uncomfortable, raw forms of the living beings who pass through on their journeys above. Fortunately, these labs provide everything I need in my research and more. There is no need to ever visit the surface, save for the summons on the Lord's orders. A virus capable of devouring and converting almost anything. And nanotechnology constructed painstakingly for the sake of control. Development was swift, and every piece fell into place almost eerily, forming an abhorrent existence. I struggled to think of practical applications which would be friendly to common life forms. However, it is not a major concern. Many were hesitant to continue its creation but I granted them leave if they desired. I would have no need for any who were not entirely as dedicated as my machines. Mechanically augmented, the Queen Bee which I had prior experimented on was theoretically a perfect host for the plague virus. When the first signs of the technology bonding with the creature began, however, the problems also showed immediately. The mind of the insect fought the control of the nanotechnology, nothing like the simpler creatures I had used as test subjects. It grew increasingly violent, and only once subdued did it receive 
simple orders. However, if we were to utilize it at all, there is no other way than to let it roam free entirely. I will consider this further. A freezing tundra, where only creatures entirely adapted to the sub-zero temperatures exist and thrive. It is a shocking transition from the forests of the purity and the sun-baked desert. A climate like this should not exist naturally in this part of the world with ease. The weather patterns seem to shift unnaturally around the skies of these icy plains. There is likely a reason for this, which necessitates further research. Intriguing. Though embedded deep into the caverns of ice and worn from centuries of frost and melt water, I have uncovered several mechanisms which once filled the tunnels here. The ingenuity present is remarkable, and I have found parallels within my own work, as well as devices even I have something to learn from. From where do these come? Why machinery so complex in so sparse and dreary a habitat? Perhaps they are related to the unnatural conditions. I am not the only singular being to inhabit this biome. Once before, the Archmage who opposed the Lord resided here, cloaked by constant artificial blizzards of his own creation, which no longer fall. He likely chose this place as a conduit for research into his ice spells and extended the period of time that this place remained in frozen. Deep underground, my research and materials lay well protected, but above in the natural storms there are traces of the prison of ice he resides in, still haunting its place of creation. Preserved for millennia, a paradise for the living beings who sought shelter in prehistoric seas. They remain untouched by evolution, save for their adaptions to the oxygen-starved waters and dim crystals continuing to thrive. One mystery which continues to escape my understanding, however, is how large some of the creatures have become. There is a blatant lack of nutrient and oxygen in the caves, and yet... The marine life in these caves do have eyes, though they are barely functional, dull by lack of use, 
and milky white upon observation. Under tough, gnarled hides, crystals find an easy purchase and grow in great numbers, providing the creature's protection. Perhaps another adaption to the life they have adopted. The most striking wonder is within their bodies. In specimens dissected, I have noticed that the mineral is buried into their very digestive systems and perhaps through some chemical process pass nutrients into their sluggish hosts. A peculiar yet entirely beneficial interaction. A specimen which has developed a grand size and inexplicably impressive psychic abilities. What is most curious is its strong connection to its lesser kin. Without any noticeable communication, when it comes under threat, other mollusks rally to its aggressor and begin attacking. Is this perhaps the very first signs of a higher life form, the evolutionary link hidden away in the sunken sea, or a self-sacrificial fluke which would lead to their destruction if they inhabited any other area than these pacified caverns. Hung low in orbit, masses of ground and various parts of the world provide a secluded and distant point for research, undeniably optimal for the science of astronomy and otherwise. In my labs here, I grow many things, testing their limits against the cold and vacuum of the stratosphere. Though not many survive, the existence of certain creatures here confirm the capabilities of life simply given more time. I do not care much for the interstellar or the cosmos. Though I have traversed it, there is simply plenty in my own world to manage and discover at this time. Even if once inhabited a different planet, the Lord's wishes that I provide him machinery were the only condition that I needed to leave it and settle elsewhere. Once I have discovered and dissected every part of this place, perhaps then I could look up towards the macroscope. The bloated cosmic worm, though I understand why the Lord decides to employ it, given he can control it, is a disgusting existence. However, the idea of creating an armor suited to it in every way was an offer I could not refuse. Forged from the cosmic steel of my own creation, it resists nearly any attack yet allows the creature the same flexibility it would have without it, as well as augmenting its dimensional abilities. I remain pleased with the result.
entire landscape is a constant source of geothermal energy and heat for a forge. If it was not entirely uninhabitable, save for demons and spirits, I would conduct much more of my research in the bowels of the earth, where I have actively chosen not to settle, however, is the crags of the underworld. There, the magma is uncooperative and far more corrosive than should be possible, as it is saturated with cursed, twisted souls, courtesy of that witch. A blade completely inundated with my surroundings during the time of its creation. It was tempered by the fires which are fueled by spirits and formed in the magma I draw into my laboratories. Its cutting edge unparalleled, though its reach is limited, making general use questionable. I would consider it my very first foray into work for the sake of craftsmanship and art. If I was born synthetically, any creation which leads one to question whether I was is a creation I may be proud of. It shows that I can, after all, be graced by a mute. What a terrible abomination, and yet an enticing subject. Not unlike the fusion of spirits which haunts the dungeons, this entity is formed not of one, but a multitude of sinners. What holds different for it, however, is that the limitations caused by the artificiality of the dungeon's existence do not apply to it. It is the laws of hell which brought them together into a single overlord of the underworld. And when an innocent life is sacrificed, their hunger, which appears to be in tune with the afterlife, surges.